Chapter Six of the Patchwork Girl of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman. The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter Six: The Journey. Ojo had never traveled before, and so he only knew that the path down the mountainside led into the open Munchkin country where large numbers of people dwelt. Scraps was quite new and not supposed to know anything of the land of Oz, while the glass cat admitted she had never wandered very far away from the magician's house. There was only one path before them at the beginning, so they could not miss their way, and for a time they walked through the thick forest in silent thought, each one impressed with the importance of the adventure they had undertaken. Suddenly the patchwork girl laughed. It was funny to see her laugh, because her cheeks wrinkled up, her nose tipped, her silver button eyes twinkled, and her mouth curled at the corners in a comical way. "'Has something pleased you?' asked Ojo, who was feeling solemn and joyless through thinking upon his uncle's sad fate. "'Yes,' she answered. "'Your world pleases me, for it's a queer world, and life in it is queerer still.' here am i made from an old bed quilt and intended to be a slave to margolotte rendered free as air by an accident that none of you could foresee i am enjoying life and seeing the world while the woman who made me is standing helpless as a block of wood if that isn't funny enough to laugh at i don't know what is you're not seeing much of the world yet my poor innocent scraps remarked the cat the world doesn't consist wholly of the trees that are on all sides of us "'But they're part of it, and aren't they pretty trees?' returned Scraps, bobbing her head until her brown yarn curls fluttered in the breeze. "'Growing between them I can see lovely ferns and wildflowers and soft green mosses. If the rest of your world is half as beautiful, I shall be glad I'm alive.' "'I don't know what the rest of the world is like, I'm sure,' said the cat. "'But I mean to find out.' "'I have never been out of the forest,' Ojo added. But to me the trees are gloomy and sad, and the wild flowers seem lonesome. It must be nicer where there are no trees, and there is room for lots of people to live together. "'I wonder if any of the people we shall meet will be as splendid as I am,' said the patchwork girl. "'All I have seen so far have pale, colorless skins and clothes as blue as the country they live in, while I am of many gorgeous colors, face and body and clothes. That is why I am bright and contented, Ojo, and while you are blue and sad.' "'I think I made a mistake in giving you so many sorts of brains,' observed the boy. "'Perhaps, as the magician said, you have an overdose, and they may not agree with you.' "'What had you to do with my brains?' asked Scraps. "'A lot,' replied Ojo. "'Old Margolotte meant to give you only a few, just enough to keep you going. "'But when she wasn't looking, I added a good many more of the best kinds I could find in the magician's cupboard. "'Thanks!' said the girl, dancing along the path ahead of Ojo and then dancing back to his side. "'If a few brains are good, many brains must be better.' "'But they ought to be evenly balanced,' said the boy, "'and I had no time to be careful. From the way you're acting, I guess the dose was badly mixed.' "'Scraps hasn't enough brains to hurt her, so don't worry,' remarked the cat, which was trotting along in a very dainty and graceful manner. The only brains worth considering are mine, which are pink. You can see them work. After walking a long time, they came to a little brook that trickled across the path, and here Ojo sat down to rest and eat something from his basket. He found that the magician had given him part of a loaf of bread and a slice of cheese. He broke off some of the bread and was surprised to find the loaf just as large as it was before. It was the same way with the cheese. However much he broke off from the slice, it remained exactly the same size. Ah, said he, nodding wisely, that's magic. Dr. Pipt has enchanted the bread and the cheese, so it will last me all through my journey, however much I eat. Why do you put those things into your mouth? asked Scraps, gazing at him in astonishment. Do you need more stuffing? Then why don't you use cotton, such as I am stuffed with? I don't need that kind, said Ojo. "'But a mouth is to talk with, isn't it?' "'It is also to eat with,' replied the boy. "'If I didn't put food into my mouth and eat it, I would get hungry and starve.' "'Ah, I didn't know that,' she said. "'Give me some!' 
Ojo handed her a bit of the bread, and she put it in her mouth. What next? she asked, scarcely able to speak. Chew it and swallow it, said the boy. Scraps tried that. Her pearl teeth were unable to chew the bread, and beyond her mouth there was no opening. Being unable to swallow, she threw away the bread and laughed. I must get hungry and starve, for I can't eat, she said. Neither can I, announced the cat. But I'm not fool enough to try. Can't you understand that you and I are superior people and not made like these poor humans? Why should I understand that or anything else? asked the girl. Don't bother my head by asking conundrums. I beg of you. Just let me discover myself in my own way. With this she began amusing herself by leaping across the brook and back again. Be careful or you'll fall in the water, warned Ojo. Never mind. You'd better. If you get wet, you'll be soggy and can't walk. Your colors might run, too, he said. Don't my colors run whenever I run? she asked. Not in the way I mean. If they get wet, the reds and greens and yellows and purples of your patches might run into each other and become just a blur. No color at all, you know. Then said the patchwork girl. I'll be careful, for if I spoiled my splendid colors, I would cease to be beautiful. Puh! sneered the glass cat. Such colors are not beautiful. They're ugly and in bad taste. Please notice that my body has no color at all. I'm transparent except for my exquisite red heart and my lovely pink brains. You can see them work. Shoo, 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 cried Scraps, dancing around and laughing. And your horrid green eyes, Miss Bungle. You can't see your eyes, but we can, and I notice you're very proud of what little color you have. Shoo, Miss Bungle, shoo, shoo, shoo. If you were all colors, and many colors as I am, you'd be too stuck up for anything. She leaped over the cat and back again, and the startled Bungle crept close to a tree to escape her. This made Scraps laugh more heartily than ever, and she said, Whoop! The cat has lost her shoe. Her tootsie's bare, but she don't care, so what's the odds to you? Dear me, Ojo, said the cat. Don't you think the creature is a little bit crazy? It may be, he answered with a puzzled look. If she continues her insults, I'll scratch off her suspender button eyes, declared the cat. Don't quarrel, please pleaded the boy, rising to resume the journey. Let us be good comrades, and as happy and cheerful as possible, for we are likely to meet with plenty of trouble on our way. It was nearly sundown when they came to the edge of the forest, and saw spread out before them a delightful landscape. There were broad blue fields stretching for miles over the valley, which was dotted everywhere with pretty blue-domed houses, none of which, however, was very near to the place where they stood. Just at the point where the path left the forest stood a tiny house, covered with leaves from the trees, and before this stood a munchkin man with an axe in his hand. He seemed very much surprised when Ojo and Scraps and the glass cat came out of the woods, but as the patchwork girl approached nearer, he sat down upon a bench and laughed so hard that he could not speak for a long time. This man was a woodchopper, and lived all alone in the little house. He had bushy blue whiskers and merry blue eyes, and his blue clothes were quite old and worn. "'Mercy me!' exclaimed the woodchopper, when at last he could stop laughing. "'Who would think such a funny harlequin lived in the land of Oz? Where did you come from, crazy quilt?' "'Do you mean me?' asked the patchwork girl. "'Of course,' he replied. "'You misjudge my ancestry. I'm not a crazy quilt. I'm patchwork,' she said. "'There's no difference,' he replied, beginning to laugh again. "'When my old grandmother sews such things together, she calls it a crazy quilt. "'But I never thought such a jumble could come to life.' "'It was the magic powder that did it,' explained Ojo. "'Oh, then you have come from the crooked magician on the mountain. "'I might have known it for—' "'Well, I declare, here's a glass cat.' "'But the magician will get in trouble for this.' It's against the law for anyone to work magic except Glinda the Good and the Royal Wizard of Oz. If you people, or things, or glass spectacles, or crazy quilts, or whatever you are, go near the Emerald City, you'll be arrested. 
"'We're going there anyhow,' declared Scraps, sitting upon the bench and swinging her stuffed legs. "'If any of us takes a rest, we'll be arrested, sure, and get no restitution, cause the rest we must endure.' "'I see,' said the woodchopper, nodding. "'You're as crazy as the crazy quilt you're made of.' "'She really is crazy,' remarked the glass cat. "'But that isn't to be wondered at when you remembered how many different things she's made of. "'For my part, I'm made of pure glass, except my jewel heart and my pretty pink brains.' Did you notice my brain, stranger? You can see em warp. So I can, replied the woodchopper. But I can't say that they accomplish much. A glass cat is a useless sort of thing, but a patchwork girl is really useful. She makes me laugh, and laughter is the best thing in life. There was once a woodchopper, a friend of mine, who was made all of tin, and I used to laugh every time I saw him. A tin woodchopper, said Ojo. That is strange. My friend wasn't always tin, said the man. But he was careless with his axe, and used to chop himself very badly. Whenever he lost an arm or a leg, he had it replaced with tin. So after a while he was all tin. And could he chop wood then? asked the boy. He could if he didn't rust his tin joints. But one day he met Dorothy in the forest and went with her to the Emerald City where he made his fortune. He is now one of the favorites of Princess Ozma, and she has made him Emperor of the Winkies, the country where all is yellow. Who is Dorothy? inquired the patchwork girl. A little maid who used to live in Kansas, but is now a princess of Oz. She is Ozma's best friend, they say, and lives with her in the royal palace. Is Dorothy made of tin? inquired Ojo. Is she patchwork like me? inquired Scraps. No, said the man. Dorothy is flesh, just as I am. I know of only one tin person, and that is Nick Chopper, the tin woodman. And there will never be but one patchwork girl, for any magician that sees you will refuse to make another one like you. I suppose we shall see the tin woodman, for we are going to the country of the Winkies, said the boy. What for? asked the woodchopper. To get the left wing of a yellow butterfly. It is a long journey, declared the man, and you will go through lonely parts of Oz and cross rivers and traverse dark forests before you get there. "'Suits me all right,' said Scraps. "'I'll get a chance to see the country.' "'You're crazy, girl. "'Better crawl into a rag-bag and hide there, "'or give yourself to some little girl to play with. "'Those who travel are likely to meet trouble. "'That's why I stay at home.' "'The woodchopper then invited them all to stay the night at his little hut, "'but they were anxious to get on, and so left him and continued along the path, "'which was broader now and more distinct.' They expected to reach some other house before it grew dark, but the twilight was brief, and Ojo soon began to fear that they had made a mistake in leaving the woodchopper. "'I can scarcely see the path,' he said at last. "'Can you see it, Scraps?' "'No,' replied the patchwork girl, who was holding fast to the boy's arm so he could guide her. "'I can see,' declared the glass cat. My eyes are better than yours, and my pink brains— Never mind your pink brains, please, said Ojo hastily. Just run ahead and show us the way. Wait a minute, and I'll tie a string to you, for then you can lead us. He got a string from his pocket and tied it around the cat's neck, and after that the creature guided them along the path. They had proceeded in this way for about an hour, when a twinkling blue light appeared ahead of them. Good! "'There's a house at last!' cried Ojo. "'When we reach it, the good people will surely welcome us and give us a night's lodging.' But however far they walked, the light seemed to get no nearer, so by and by the cat stopped short, saying, "'I think the light is travelling too, and we shall never be able to catch up with it. But here is a house by the roadside, so why go farther?' 
Where is the house, Bungle? Just here beside us, Scraps. Ojo was now able to see a small house near the pathway. It was dark and silent, but the boy was tired and wanted to rest, so he went up to the door and knocked. Who is there? cried a voice from within. I am Ojo the Unlucky, and with me are Miss Scraps Patchwork and the Glass Cat, he replied. What do you want? asked the voice. A place to sleep, said Ojo. Come in, then, but don't make any noise, and you must go directly to bed, returned the voice. Ojo unlatched the door and entered. It was very dark inside, and he could see nothing at all. But the cat exclaimed, Why, there's no one here. There must be, said the boy. Someone spoke to me. I can see everything in the room, replied the cat, and no one is present but ourselves. But here are three beds all made up, so we may as well go to sleep. What is sleep? inquired the patchwork girl. It's what you do when you go to bed, said Ojo. But why do you go to bed? persisted the patchwork girl. Here, here. "'You are making altogether too much noise,' cried the voice they had heard before. "'Keep quiet, strangers, and go to bed.' The cat, which could see in the dark, looked sharply around for the owner of the voice, but could discover no one, although the voice had seemed close beside them. She arched her back a little and seemed afraid. Then she whispered to Ojo, "'Come,' and led him to a bed. With his hands the boy felt of the bed and found it was big and soft, with feather pillows and plenty of blankets. So he took off his shoes and hat and crept into the bed. Then the cat led Scraps to another bed, and the patchwork girl was puzzled to know what to do with it. "'Lie down and keep quiet,' whispered the cat warningly. "'Can't I sing?' asked Scraps. "'No.' "'Can't I whistle?' asked Scraps. No. Can't I dance till morning if I want to? asked Scraps. You must keep quiet, said the cat in a soft voice. I don't want to, replied the patchwork girl, speaking as loudly as usual. What right have you to order me around? If I want to talk or yell or whistle— Before she could say anything more, an unseen hand seized her firmly and threw her out of the door, which closed behind her with a sharp slam. She found herself bumping and rolling in the road, and when she got up and tried to open the door of the house again, she found it locked. "'What has happened to Scraps?' asked Ojo. "'Never mind. Let's go to sleep, or something will happen to us,' answered the glass cat. So Ojo snuggled down in his bed and fell asleep, and he was so tired that he never wakened until broad daylight. End of chapter 6 Recording by Miriam Esther Goldman Seven of the Patchwork Girl of Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Elizabeth Serenka the Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum Chapter 7 The Troublesome Phonograph When the boy opened his eyes the next morning, he looked carefully around the room. These small munchkin houses seldom had more than one room in them. That in which Ojo now found himself had three beds, set all in a row on one side of it. The glass cat lay asleep on one bed. Ojo was in the second and the third was neatly made up and smooth for the day. On the other side of the room was a round table in which breakfast was already placed, smoking hot. Only one chair was drawn up to the table, where a place was set for one person. No one seemed to be in the room except the boy and Bungle. Ojo got up and put on his shoes. Finding a toilet stand at the head of his bed, he washed his face and hands and brushed his hair. Then he went to the table and said, I wonder if this is my breakfast. Eat it, commanded a voice at his side. 
so near that Ojo jumped. No person could he see. He was hungry, and the breakfast looked good, so he sat down and ate all he wanted. Then rising, he took his hat and wakened the glass cat. Come on, Bungle, said he. We must go. He cast another glance about the room, and speaking to the air, he said, Whoever lives here has been kind to me, and I'm much obliged. There was no answer, so he took his basket and went out the door, the cat following him. In the middle of the path sat the patchwork girl, playing with pebbles she had picked up. Oh, there you are, she exclaimed cheerfully. I thought you were never coming out. It has been daylight a long time. What did you do all night? asked the boy. Sat here and watched the stars and the moon, she replied. They're interesting. I never saw them before, you know. Of course not, said Ojo. You are crazy to act so badly and get thrown outdoors, remarked Bungle, as they renewed their journey. That's all right, said Scraps. If I hadn't been thrown out, I wouldn't have seen the stars nor the big gray wolf. What wolf? inquired Ojo. The one that came to the door of the house three times during the night. I don't see why that should be, said the boy thoughtfully. There was plenty to eat in that house, for I had a fine breakfast, and I slept in a nice bed. Don't you feel tired? asked the patchwork girl, noticing that the boy yawned. Why, yes, I'm tired, as I was last night, and yet I slept very well. And aren't you hungry? It's strange, replied Ojo. I had a good breakfast, and yet I think I'll now eat some of my crackers and cheese. Scraps danced up and down the path, then she sang, Kizzle, Kazzle, Core, the wolf is at the door. There's nothing to eat but a bone without meat and a bill from the grocery store. What does that mean? asked Ojo. Don't ask me, replied Scraps. I say what comes into my head, but of course I know nothing of grocery stores or bones without meat, or very much else. No, said the cat. She's stark, staring, raving crazy, and her brains can't be pink, for they don't work properly. Bother the brains, cried Scraps. Who cares for a menu, how? Have you noticed how beautiful my patches are in the sunlight? Just then they heard a sound as of footsteps pattering along the path behind them, and all three t turned to see what was coming. To their astonishment, they beheld a small round table running as fast as its four spindle legs could carry it, and to the top was screwed fast a phonograph with a big gold horn. Hold on, shouted the phonograph. Wait for me. Goodness me, it's that music thing which the crooked magician scattered the powder of life over, said Ojo. So it is, returned Bungle, in a grumpy tone of voice. And then, as the phonograph overtook them, the glass cat added sternly, What are you doing here, anyhow? I've run away, said the music thing. After you left, old Dr. Pipped and I had a dreadful quarrel, and he threatened to smash me to pieces if I didn't keep quiet. Of course I wouldn't do that, because a talking machine is supposed to talk and make a noise and sometimes music. So I slipped out of the house while the magician was stirring his four kettles, and I've been running after you all night. Now that I've found such pleasant company, I can talk and play tunes all I want to. Ojo was greatly annoyed by this unwelcome addition to the party. At first he did not know what to say to the newcomer, but a little thought decided him not to make friends. We are traveling on an important business, he declared, and you'll excuse me if I say we can't be bothered. How very impolite, exclaimed the phonograph. I'm sorry, but it's true, said the boy. You'll have to go somewhere else. This is very unkind treatment, I must say, whined the phonograph in an injured tone. Everyone seems to hate me, and yet I was intended to amuse people. It isn't... You we hate especially, observed the glass cat. It's your dreadful music. When I lived in the same room with you, I was much annoyed by your squeaky horn. 
It growls and grumbles and clicks and scratches, so it spoils the music, and your machinery rumbles so that the racket drowns every tune you attempt. That isn't my fault. It's the fault of my records. I must admit that I haven't a clear record, answered the machine. Just the same. You'll have to go away, said Ojo. Wait a minute, cried Scraps. This music thing interests me. I remember to have heard music when I first came to life, and I would like to hear it again. What's your name, my poor abused phonograph? Victor Columbia Edison, it answered. Well, I shall call you Vic for short, said the patchwork girl. Go ahead and play something. It'll drive you crazy, warned the cat. I'm crazy now, according to your statement. Loosen up and reel out the music, Vic. The only record I have with me, explained the phonograph, is the one the magician attached just before we had a quarrel. It's a highly classical composition. A what? inquired Scraps. It is classical music, and it is considered the best and most puzzling ever manufactured. You're supposed to like it, whether you do or not, and if you don't, the proper thing is to look as if you did. Understand? Not in the least, said Scraps. Then listen. At once the machine began to play, and in a few minutes, Ojo put his hand to his ears to shut out the sounds, and the cat snarled and Scraps began to laugh. Cut it out, Vic, she said. That's enough. But the phonograph continued playing the dreary tune, so Ojo seized the crank, jerked it free, and threw it into the road. However, the moment the crank struck the ground, it bounded back to the machine again and began winding it up, and still the music played. Let's run, cried Scraps, and they all started and ran down the path as fast as they could go. But the phonograph was right behind them, and could run and play at the same time, it called out reproachfully, What's the matter? Don't you love classical music? No, Vic, said Scraps, halting. We will pass the coal, the classical, and preserve what joy we have left. I haven't any nerves, thank goodness, but your music makes my cotton shrink. Then turn over my record. There's a ragtime tune on the other side, said the machine. What's ragtime? The opposite of classical. All right, said Scraps, and turned over the record. The phonograph now began to play a jerky jumble of sounds, which proved so bewildering that after a moment Scraps stuffed her patchwork apron into the gold horn and cried, Stop! Stop! That's the other extreme. It's extremely bad. Muffled as it was, the phonograph played on. If you don't shut off that music, I'll smash your record, threatened Ojo. The music stopped at that, and the machine turned its horn from one to another, and said with a great indignation, What's the matter now? Is it possible you can't appreciate ragtime? Scraps ought to, being rags herself, said the cat. But I simply can't stand it. It makes my whiskers curl. It is indeed dreadful, exclaimed Ojo with a shudder. It's enough to drive a crazy lady mad, murmured the patchwork girl. I'll tell you what, Vic, she added as she smoothed out her apron and put it on again. For some reason or other, you've missed your guess. You're not a concert. You're a nuisance. Music hath charms to soothe the savage beast, asserted the phonograph sadly. Then we're not savages. I advise you to go home and beg the magician's pardon. Never, he'd smash me. That's what we shall do if you stay here, Ojo declared. Run along, Vic, and bother someone else, advised Scraps. Find someone who is real wicked and stay with him till he repents. In that way you can do some good in the world. The music thing turned silently away and trotted down a side path toward a distant munchkin village. Is that the way we go? asked Bungle anxiously. No, said Ojo. I think we shall keep straight ahead, for this path is the widest and best. 
when we come to some house we will inquire the way to the emerald city end of chapter seven recording by elizabeth Zarenka. chapter eight of the patchwork girl of oz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by elizabeth Serenka. the patchwork girl of oz by l frank baum chapter eight the foolish owl and the wise donkey on they went and half an hour's steady walking brought them to a house somewhat better than the two they had already passed. It stood close to the roadside, and over the door was a sign that read, Miss Foolish Owl and Mr. Wise Donkey, Public Advisors. When Ojo read the sign aloud, Scrap said laughingly, Well, here's the place to get all the advice we want, maybe more than we need. Let's go in. The boy knocked at the door. Come in called a deep bass voice. So they opened the door and entered the house, where a little light brown donkey, dressed in a blue apron and a blue cap, was engaged in dusting the furniture with the blue cloth. On a shelf over the window sat a great blue owl, with a blue sunbonnet on her head, blinking her big round eyes at the visitors. "'Good morning,' said the donkey in his deep voice, which seemed bigger than he was. Did you come to us for advice? Why, we came anyhow, replied Scraps, and now we are here, we may as well have some advice. It's free, isn't it? Certainly, said the donkey. Advice doesn't cost anything, unless you follow it. Permit me to say, by the way, that you are the queerest lot of travelers that ever came into my shop. Judging you merely by appearances, I think you'd better talk to the foolish owl yonder. They turned to look at the bird, which fluttered its wings and stared back at them with its big eyes. Hoot teet toot teet toot, cried the owl. Fiddle come foo, how de do, riddle come tittle come, too ra la loo. That beats your poetry, Scraps, said Ojo. It's just nonsense, declared the glass cat. But it's good advice for the foolish, said the donkey admiringly. Listen to my partner, and you can't go wrong, said the owl in a grumbling voice. Patrick girl has come to life, no one's sweetheart, no one's wife. Lacking sense and loving fun, she'll be snubbed by everyone. Quite a compliment, quite a compliment, I declare, exclaimed the donkey, turning to look at Scraps. You are certainly a wonder, my dear, and I fancy you'd make a splendid pincushion. If you belonged to me, I'd wear smoked glasses when I looked at you. Why? asked the patchwork girl. Because you are so gay and gaudy. It is my beauty that dazzles you, she asserted. You munchkin people all strut around in your stupid blue color while I— You are wrong in calling me a munchkin interrupted the donkey for i was born in the land of mo and i came to visit the land of oz on the day it was shut off from the rest of the world so here i am obliged to stay and i confess it is a very pleasant country to live in hoot teet toot cried the owl ojo's searching for a charm cause unk nunkies come to harm charms are scarce they're hard to get ojo's got a job you bet is the owl so very foolish asked the boy extremely so replied the donkey notice what vulgar expressions she uses but i admire the owl for the reason that she is positively foolish owls are supposed to be so very wise generally that a foolish one is unusual and you perhaps know that anything or anyone unusual is sure to be interesting to the wise the owl flapped its wings again muttering these words it's hard to be a glassy cat no cat can be more hard than that she's so transparent every act it's clear to us and that's a fact have you noticed my pink brains inquired bungle proudly 
you can see em work not in the daytime said the donkey she can't see very well by day poor thing but her advice is excellent i advise you to follow it the owl hasn't given us any advice as yet the boy declared no then what do you call all those sweet poems just foolishness replied ojo scraps does the same thing foolishness of course to be sure the foolish owl must be foolish or she wouldn't be the foolish owl you are very complimentary to my partner indeed asserted the donkey rubbing his front hoofs together as if highly pleased the sign says that you are wise marked scraps to the donkey i wish you would prove it with great pleasure returned the beast put me to the test my dear patches and i'll prove my wisdom in the wink of an eye what is the best way to get to the emerald city asked ojo walk said the donkey i know but what road shall i take was the boy's next question the road of yellow bricks of course it leads directly to the emerald city and how shall we find the road of yellow bricks by keeping along the path you have been following you'll come to the yellow bricks pretty soon and you'll know them when you see them because they're the only yellow things in the blue country thank you said the boy at least you have told me something is that the extent of your wisdom asked scraps no replied the donkey i know many other things but they wouldn't interest you so i'll give you a last word of advice move on for the sooner you do that the sooner you get to the emerald city of oz hoot toot 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 screeched the owl off you go fast or slow where you going you don't know patches bungle munchkin lad facing fortunes good and bad meeting dangers grave and sad sometimes worried sometimes glad where you're going you don't know nor do i but off you go sounds like a hint to me said the patchwork girl then let's take it and go replied ojo they said good-bye to the wise donkey and the foolish owl and at once resumed their journey end of chapter eight recording by elizabeth saranka chapter nine of the patchwork girl of oz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Denise Stradling. The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 9 They Meet the Woozy. There seem to be very few houses around here after all, remarked Ojo, after they had walked for a time in silence. Never mind, said Scraps. We are not looking for houses, but rather the road of yellow bricks. Won't it be funny to run across something yellow in this dismal blue country? There are worse colors than yellow in this country, asserted the glass cat in a spiteful tone. Oh, do you mean the pink pebbles you call your brains, and your red heart and green eyes? asked the patchwork girl. No, I mean you, if you must know it, growled the cat. You're jealous, laughed Scraps. You'd give your whiskers for a lovely variegated complexion like mine. I wouldn't, retorted the cat. I've the clearest complexion in the world, and I don't employ a beauty doctor either. I see you don't, said Scraps. Please don't quarrel, begged Ojo. This is an important journey, and quarreling makes me discouraged. To be brave, one must be cheerful, so I hope you will be as good-tempered as possible. They had traveled some distance when suddenly they faced a high fence which barred any further progress straight ahead. It ran directly across the road and enclosed a small forest of tall trees set close together. When the group of adventurers peered through the bars of the fence, they thought this forest looked more gloomy and forbidding than any they had ever seen before. They soon discovered that the path they had been following now made a bend and passed around the enclosure. But what made Ojo stop and look thoughtful was a sign painted on the fence, which read, Beware of the woozy. That means, 
he said, that there's a woozy inside that fence, and the woozy must be a dangerous animal, or they wouldn't tell people to beware of it. Let's keep out, then, replied Scraps. That path is outside the fence, and Mr. Woozy may have all his little forest to himself, for all we care. But one of our errands is to find a woozy, Ojo explained. The magician wants me to get three hairs from the end of a woozy's tail. Let's go on and find some other woozy, suggested the cat. This one is ugly and dangerous, or they wouldn't cage him up. Maybe we shall find another that is tame and gentle. Perhaps there isn't any other at all, answered Ojo. The sign doesn't say, Beware a woozy. It says, Beware the woozy, which may mean there's only one in all the land of Oz. Then, said Scraps, suppose we go in and find him. Very likely, if we ask him politely to let us pull three hairs out of the tip of his tail, he won't hurt us. It would hurt him, I'm sure, and that would make him cross, said the cat. You needn't worry, Bungle, remarked the patchwork girl, for if there is danger, you can climb a tree. Ojo and I are not afraid, are we, Ojo? I am a little, the boy admitted. But this danger must be faced if we intend to save poor Unc Nunky. How shall we get over the fence? Climb, answered Scraps, and at once she began climbing up the rows of bars. Ojo followed and found it more easy than he had expected. When they got to the top of the fence, they began to get down on the other side, and soon were in the forest. The glass cat, being small, crept between the lower bars and joined them. Here there was no path of any sort, so they entered the woods, the boy leading the way, and wandered through the trees until they were nearly in the center of the forest. They now came upon a clear space in which stood a rocky cave. So far they had met no living creature, but when Ojo saw the cave he knew it must be the den of the woozy. It is hard to face any savage beast without a sinking of the heart, but still more terrifying is it to face an unknown beast, which you have never seen even a picture of. So there is little wonder that the pulses of the munchkin boy beat fast as he and his companion stood facing the cave. The opening was perfectly square, and about big enough to admit a goat. "'I guess the woozy is asleep,' said Scraps. "'Shall I throw in a stone to waken him?' "'No, please don't,' answered Ojo, his voice trembling a little. "'I'm in no hurry.' But he had not long to wait, for the woozy heard the sound of voices and came trotting out of his cave. As this is the only woozy that has ever lived, either in the land of Oz or out of it, I must describe it to you. The creature was all squares and flat surfaces and edges. Its head was an exact square, like one of the building blocks a child plays with. Therefore, it had no ears, but heard sounds through two openings in the upper corners. Its nose, being in the center of a square surface, was flat while the mouth was formed by the opening of the lower edge of the block. The body of the woozy was much larger than its head, but was likewise block-shaped, being twice as long as it was wide and high. The tail was square and stubby and perfectly straight, and the four legs were made in the same way, each being four-sided. The animal was covered with a thick, smooth skin, and had no hair at all except at the extreme end of its tail, where there grew exactly three stiff, stubby hairs. The beast was dark blue in color, and his face was not fierce nor ferocious in expression, but rather good-humored and droll. Seeing the strangers, the woozy folded his hind legs as if they had been hinged and sat down to look his visitors over. "'Well, well!' he exclaimed. What a queer lot you are! At first I thought some of those miserable munchkin farmers had come to annoy me, but I am relieved to find you in their stead. It is plain to me that you are a remarkable group, as remarkable in your way as I am in mine, and so you are welcome to my domain. 
Nice place, isn't it? But lonesome. Dreadfully lonesome. Why did they shut you up here? asked Scraps, who was regarding the queer, square creature with much curiosity. Because I eat up all the honey bees, which the munchkin farmers who live around here keep to make them honey. Are you fond of eating honey bees? inquired the boy. Very. They are really delicious. But the farmers did not like to lose their bees, and so they tried to destroy me. Of course, they couldn't do that. Why not? My skin is so thick and tough that nothing can get through it to hurt me. So, finding they could not destroy me, they drove me into this forest and built a fence around me. Unkind, wasn't it? But what do you eat now? asked Ojo. Nothing at all. I've tried the leaves from the trees and the mosses and creeping vines, but they don't seem to suit my taste. So, there being no honeybees here, I've eaten nothing for years. You must be awfully hungry, said the boy. I've got some bread and cheese in my basket. Would you like that kind of food? Give me a nibble and I'll try it. Then I can tell you better whether it is grateful to my appetite, returned the woozy. So the boy opened his basket and broke a piece off the loaf of bread. He tossed it toward the woozy, who cleverly caught it in his mouth and ate it in a twinkling. That's rather good, declared the animal. Any more? Try some cheese, said Ojo, and threw down a piece. The woozy ate that too and smacked its long, thin lips. That's mighty good, it exclaimed. Any more? Plenty, replied Ojo. So he sat down on a stump and fed the woozy bread and cheese for a long time, for no matter how much the boy broke off, the loaf and the slice remained just as big. That'll do, said the woozy at last. I'm quite full. I hope the strange food won't give me indigestion. I hope not, said Ojo. It's what I eat. Well, I must say I'm much obliged, and I'm glad you came, announced the beast. Is there anything I can do in return for your kindness? Yes, said Ojo earnestly. You have it in your power to do me a great favor, if you will. What is it? asked the woozy. Name the favor, and I will grant it. I... I want three hairs from the tip of your tail, said Ojo, with some hesitation. Three hairs? Why, that's all I have, on my tail or anywhere else, exclaimed the beast. I know, but I want them very much. They are my sole ornaments, my prettiest feature, said the woozy uneasily. If I give up those three hairs, I... I'm just a blockhead. Yet I must have them, insisted the boy firmly, and he then told the woozy all about the accident to Unc Nunky and Margolotta, and how the three hairs were to be part of the magic charm that would restore them to life. The beast listened with attention. And when Ojo had finished the recital, it said, with a sigh, I always keep my word, for I pride myself on being square. So you may have the three hairs, and welcome. I think, under such circumstances, it would be selfish in me to refuse you. Thank you, thank you very much, cried the boy joyfully. May I pull out the hairs now? Any time you like, answered the woozy. So Ojo went up to the queer creature, and taking hold of one of the hairs, began to pull. He pulled harder. He pulled with all his might, but the hair remained fast. "'What's the trouble?' asked the woozy, which Ojo had dragged here and there all around the clearing in his endeavor to pull out the hair. "'It won't come,' said the boy, panting. "'I was afraid of that.' declared the beast. You'll have to pull harder. I'll help you, exclaimed Scraps, coming to the boy's side. You pull the hair, and I'll pull you, and together we ought to get it out easily. Wait a jiffy, called the woozy, and then it went to a tree and hugged it with its front paws, so that its body couldn't be dragged around by the pull. All ready now. Go ahead. 
Ojo grasped the hare with both hands and pulled with all his strength, while Scraps seized the boy around his waist and added her strength to his. But the hare wouldn't budge. Instead, it slipped out of Ojo's hands, and he and Scraps both rolled upon the ground in a heap and never stopped until they bumped against the rocky cave. "'Give it up,' advised the glass cat, as the boy arose and assisted the patchwork girl to her feet. "'A dozen strong men couldn't pull out those hairs. I believe they're clinched on the underside of the woozy's thick skin.' "'Then what shall I do?' asked the boy, despairingly. "'If on our return I fail to take these three hairs to the crooked magician, the other things I have come to seek will be of no use at all, and we cannot restore Unc Nunky and Margolotta to life.' "'They're goners, I guess,' said the patchwork girl. "'Never mind,' added the cat. "'I can't see that old Unc and Margolotta are worth all this trouble anyhow.' But Ojo did not feel that way. He was so disheartened that he sat down upon a stump and began to cry. The woozy looked at the boy thoughtfully. "'Why don't you take me with you?' asked the beast. "'Then, when at last you get to the magician's house, he can surely find some way to pull out those three hairs.' Ojo was overjoyed at the suggestion. "'That's it!' he cried, wiping away the tears and springing to his feet with a smile. "'If I take the three hairs to the magician, it won't matter if they are still in your body.' "'It can't matter in the least,' agreed the woozy. "'Come on, then,' said the boy, picking up his basket. "'Let us start at once. I have several other things to find, you know.' But the glass cat gave a little laugh, and inquired in her scornful way, "'How do you intend to get the beast out of this forest?' That puzzled them all for a time. "'Let us go to the fence, and then we may find a way,' suggested Scraps. So they walked through the forest to the fence, reaching it at a point exactly opposite that where they had entered the enclosure. "'How did you get in?' asked the woozy. "'We climbed over,' answered Ojo. "'I can't do that,' said the beast. "'I'm a very swift runner, for I can overtake a honeybee as it flies, and I can jump very high, which is the reason they made such a tall fence to keep me in. But I can't climb at all, and I'm too big to squeeze between the bars of the fence.' Ojo tried to think what to do. "'Can you dig?' he asked. "'No,' answered the woozy. "'For I have no claws.' My feet are quite flat on the bottom of them, nor can I gnaw away the boards, as I have no teeth. You're not such a terrible creature after all, remarked Scraps. You haven't heard me growl, or you wouldn't say that, declared the woozy. When I growl, the sound echoes like thunder all through the valleys and woodlands, and children tremble with fear, and women cover their heads with their aprons, and big men run and hide. I suppose there is nothing in the world so terrible to listen to as the growl of a woozy. Please don't growl, then, begged Ojo earnestly. There is no danger of my growling, for I am not angry. Only when angry do I utter my fearful, ear-splitting, soul-shuddering growl. Also, when I am angry, my eyes flash fire, whether I growl or not. Real fire? asked Ojo. "'Of course, real fire. Do you suppose they'd flash imitation fire?' inquired the woozy, in an injured tone. "'In that case, I've solved the riddle,' cried Scraps, dancing with glee. "'Those fence boards are made of wood, and if the woozy stands close to the fence and lets his eyes flash fire, they might set fire to the fence and burn it up. Then he could walk away with us easily, being free.' "'Ah!' I have never thought of that plan, or I would have been free long ago, said the woozy. But I cannot flash fire from my eyes unless I am very angry. Can't you get angry about something, please? asked Ojo. I'll try. You just say, Crizzle Crew, to me. Will that make you angry? inquired the boy. Terribly angry. What does it mean? asked Scraps. I don't know. That's what makes me so angry. 
replied the woozy. He then stood close to the fence, with his head near one of the boards, and Scraps called out, Crizzle Crew! Then Ojo said, Crizzle Crew! And the glass cat said, Crizzle Crew! The woozy began to tremble with anger, and small sparks darted from his eyes. Seeing this, they all cried, Crizzle Crew! together, and that made the beast's eyes flash fire so fiercely that the fence board caught the sparks and began to smoke. Then it burst into flame, and the woozy stepped back and said triumphantly, Aha! That did the business all right. It was a happy thought for you to yell all together, for that made me as angry as I have ever been. Fine sparks, weren't they? Regular fireworks, replied Scraps, admiringly. In a few moments the board had burned to a distance of several feet, leaving an opening big enough for them all to pass through. Ojo broke some branches from a tree, and with them whipped the fire until it was extinguished. "'We don't want to burn the whole fence down,' said he, "'for the flames would attract the attention of the munchkin farmers, who would then come and capture the woozy again. I guess they'll be rather surprised when they find he's escaped.' "'So they will,' declared the woozy, chuckling gleefully. "'When they find I'm gone, the farmers will be badly scared, "'for they'll expect me to eat up their honeybees, as I did before.' "'That reminds me,' said the boy, "'that you must promise not to eat honeybees while you are in our company.' "'None at all?' "'Not a bee. "'You would get us all into trouble, "'and we can't afford to have any more trouble than is necessary.' I'll feed you all the bread and cheese you want, and that must satisfy you. All right, I'll promise, said the woozy cheerfully. And when I promise anything, you can depend on it, cause I'm square. I don't see what difference that makes, observed the patchwork girl, as they found the path and continued their journey. The shape doesn't make a thing honest, does it? Of course it does, returned the woozy very decidedly. No one could trust that crooked magician, for instance, just because he is crooked. But a square woozy couldn't do anything crooked if he wanted to. I'm neither square nor crooked, said Scraps, looking down at her plump body. No, you're round, so you're liable to do anything, asserted the woozy. Do not blame me, Miss Gorgeous, if I regard you with suspicion. Many a satin ribbon has a cotton back. Scraps didn't understand this, but she had an uneasy misgiving that she had a cotton back herself. It would settle down at times and make her squat and dumpy, and then she had to roll herself in the road until her body stretched out again. End of chapter 9 Recording by Denise Stradling Girl of Oz this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Inga Parsons, Marblehead, Massachusetts. The Patchwork Girl of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Chapter 10 Shaggy Man to the Rescue. They had not gone very far before Bungle, who had run on ahead, came bounding back to say that the road of yellow bricks was just before them. At once they hurried forward to see what this famous road looked like. It was a broad road, but not straight, for it wandered over hill and dale, and picked out the easiest places to go. All its length and breadth was paved with smooth bricks of a bright yellow color. So it was smooth and level, except in a few places where the bricks had crumbled or been removed, leaving holes that might cause the unwary to stumble. "'I wonder,' said Ojo, looking up and down the road, "'which way to go?' "'What are you bound for?' asked the woozy. "'The Emerald City,' he replied. "'Then go west,' said the woozy. "'I know this road pretty well, for I've chased many a honey-bee over it. "'Have you ever been to the Emerald City?' asked Graps. "'No, I am very shy by nature, as you may have noticed, "'so I haven't mingled much in society. "'Are you afraid of men?' inquired the patchwork girl. "'Me? 
With my heart-rending growl, my horrible shudderful growl, I should say not. I am not afraid of anything, declared the woozy. I wish I could say the same, sighed Ojo. I don't think we need to be afraid when we get to the Emerald City, for Unc Nunky has told me that Ozma, our girl ruler, is very lovely and kind, and tries to help everyone who is in trouble. But they say there are many dangers lurking on the road to the great fair city, and so we must be very careful. I hope nothing will break me, said the glass cat in a nervous voice. I'm a little brittle, you know, and can't stand many heart and hawks. If anything should fade the colors of my lovely patches, it would break my heart, said the patchwork girl. I'm not sure you have a heart, Ojo reminded her. Then it would break my cotton, persisted Scraps. Do you think they are all fast colors, Ojo? she asked anxiously. They seem fast enough when you run, he replied, and then, looking ahead of them, he exclaimed, Oh, what lovely trees! They were certainly pretty to look upon, and the travelers hurried forward to observe them more closely. Why, they are not trees at all, said Scraps. They are just monstrous plants. That is what they really were, masses of great broad leaves, which rose from the ground far into the air, until they towered twice as high as the top of the patchwork girl's head, who was a little taller than Ojo. The plants formed rows on both sides of the road, and from each plant rose a dozen or more of the big broad leaves, which swayed continually from side to side, although no wind was blowing. But the most curious thing about the swaying leaves was their color. They seemed to have a general groundwork of blue, but here and there other colors glinted at times through the blue, gorgeous yellows turning to pink, purple, orange, and scarlet, mingled with more sober browns and grays, each appearing as a blotch or stripe anywhere on a leaf and then disappearing, to replace by some other color of a different shape. The changeful coloring of the great leaves was very beautiful, but it was bewildering as well, and the novelty of the scene drew our travelers close to the line of plants, where they stood watching them with rapt interest. Suddenly, a leaf bent lower than usual, and touched the patchwork girl. Swiftly, it enveloped her in its embrace, covering her completely in its thick folds, and then it swayed back upon its stem. "'Why, she's gone!' gasped Ojo, in amazement and listening carefully. He thought he could hear the muffled screams of scraps coming from the center of the folded leaf. But before he could think what he ought to do to save her, another leap bent down and captured the glass cat, rolling around the little creature until she was completely hidden, and then straightening up again upon its stem. Look out! cried the woozy. Run, run fast, or you are lost! Ojo turned and saw the woozy running swiftly up the road, but the last leaf of the row of plants seized the beast even as he ran, and instantly he disappeared from sight. The boy had no chance to escape. Half a dozen of the great leaves were bending toward him from different directions, and as he stood hesitating, one of them clutched him in its embrace. In a flash he was in the dark. Then he felt himself gently lifted until he was swaying in the air, with the folds of the leaf hugging him on all sides. At first he struggled hard to escape, crying out in anger, Let me go! Let me go! But neither struggles nor protests had any effect whatever. The leaf held him firmly, and he was a prisoner. Then Ojo quieted himself and tried to think. Despair fell upon him when he remembered that all his little party had been captured, even as he was, and there was none to save them. I might have expected it, he sobbed miserably. I'm Ojo the Unlucky, and something dreadful was sure to happen to me. He pushed against the leaf that held him, and found it to be soft, but thick and firm. It was like a great bandage all around him, and he found it difficult to move his body or limbs in order to change their position. The minutes passed and became hours. Ojo wondered how long one could live in such a condition, and if the leaf would gradually sap his strength and even his life in order to feed itself. The little munchkin boy had never heard of any person dying in the land of Oz, but he knew one could suffer a great deal of pain. His greatest fear at this time was that he would always remain imprisoned in the beautiful leaf and never see the light of day again. No sound came to him through the leaf, 
All around was intense silence. Ojo wondered if Scraps had stopped screaming, or if the folds of the leaf prevented his hearing her. By and by he thought he heard a whistle, as of someone whistling a tune. <whistles> yes, it really must be someone whistling, he decided, for he could follow the strains of a pretty munchkin melody that Uncle Nunky used to sing to him. The sounds were low and sweet, and although they reached Ojo's ears very faintly, they were clear and harmonious. Could the leaf whistle? Ojo wondered. Nearer and nearer came the sounds, and then they seemed to be just the other side of the leaf that was hugging him. Suddenly the whole leaf toppled and fell, carrying the boy with it, and while he sprawled at full length the fold slowly relaxed and set him free. He scrambled quickly to his feet, and found that a strange man was standing before him. A man so curious in appearance that the boy stared with round eyes. He was a big man, with shaggy whiskers, shaggy eyebrows, shaggy hair, but kindly blue eyes that were gentle as those of a cow. On his head was a green velvet hat with a jeweled band, which was all shaggy around the brim. Rich but shaggy laces were at his throat. A coat with shaggy edges was decorated with diamond buttons. The velvet breeches had jeweled buckles at the knees and shags all around the bottoms. On his breast hung a medallion bearing a picture of Princess Dorothy of Oz, and in his hand, as he stood looking at Ojo, was a sharp knife shaped like a dagger. Oh! exclaimed Ojo, greatly astonished at the sight of this stranger, and then he added, Who has saved me, sir? Can't you see? replied the other with a smile. I'm the shaggy man. Yes, I can see that, said the boy, nodding. Was it you who rescued me from the leaf? None other, you may be sure, but take care, or I shall have to rescue you again. Ojo gave a jump, for he saw several broad leaves leaning toward him. But the shaggy man began to whistle again, and at the sound the leaves all straightened up on their stems and kept still. The man took Ojo's arm and led him up the road, past the last of the great plants, and not till he was safely beyond their reach did he cease his whistling. "'You see, the music charms him,' he said. "'Singing or whistling, it doesn't matter which. Makes him behave, and nothing else will. I always whistle as I go by him, and so they always let me alone. Today, as I went by whistling, I saw a leaf curled, and knew there must be something inside it. I cut down the leaf with my knife, and out you popped. Lucky I passed by, wasn't it? You were very kind, said Ojo, and I thank you. Will you please rescue my companions also? What companions? asked the shaggy man. The leaves grabbed them all, said the boy. There's a patchwork girl and a what? A girl made a patchwork, you know. She's alive, and her name is Scraps, and there's a glass cat. Glass? asked the shaggy man. All glass. And alive? Yes, said Ojo. She has pink brains, and there's a woozy. What's a woozy? inquired the shaggy man. Why, I, I can't describe it, answered the boy, greatly perplexed. But it's a queer animal with three hairs on the tip of its tail that won't come out and... What won't come out? asked the shaggy man. The tail? The hairs won't come out. But you'll see the woozy, if you'll please rescue it, and then you'll know just what it is. Of course, said the shaggy man, nodding his shaggy head. And then he walked back among the plants, still whistling, <whistles> and found the three leaves which were curled around Ojo's traveling companions. The first leaf he cut down released scraps, and on seeing her the shaggy man threw back his shaggy head opened wide his mouth and laughed so shaggily and yet so merrily that Scraps liked him at once. Then he took off his hat and made her a low bow, saying, My dear, you're a wonder. I must introduce you to my friend the Scarecrow. When he cut down the second leaf, he rescued the glass cat, and Bungle was so frightened that she scampered away like a streak and soon had joined Ojo, when she sat beside him panting and trembling. The last plant of all the row had captured the woozy, and a big bunch in the center of the curled leaf showed plainly where he was. With his sharp knife the shaggy man sliced off the stem of the leaf, and as it fell and unfolded out trotted the woozy, 
and escape beyond the reach of any more of the dangerous plants. End of chapter 10 Recording by Inga Parsons Marblehead, Massachusetts Website IngaParsonsLaw.com